Uh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. This is Arthur Brandwood, uh, the founder and principal consultant of Brandwood Biomedical. Welcome to this month's uh, Brandwood Live webinar um, on a China update, what's new with the CFDA. Um, the webinar today will be given by Stephen Wen. Uh, the Director of China Operations in uh, in our Beijing office with the marvels of the internet. I'm sitting here in our Sydney headquarters and Stephen's sitting in our Beijing office and uh, will join us shortly to present the webinar. Stephen has uh, about well, more than 20 years experience in Chinese medical device and IVD regulatory affairs and working with the Chinese authorities. He's held previous senior roles in Medtronic, GE Healthcare, Borshan Loam, and also worked for a small startup medical device firm. So we've seen it from all ends of the business. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to uh, say a couple of words about Brandwood Biomedical. If I can persuade this slideshow to work, there we go. Um, we're a medical devices and IVDs uh, regulatory reimbursement and clinical consultancy, um, and we really try to bring a global perspective to what we do. We have offices here in Sydney and in China, also in New Zealand, Hong Kong um, and Taiwan, um, and a global network of trusted partners that we, uh, that we work with um, to deliver a global service to our clients. To do that, we think it's important to do two things. Um, firstly, to be highly engaged with the industry, and with the regulators and to be highly networked. Um, that means that we do things like uh, we provide training and support to regulatory agencies, we provide input to guidance and policy development and we support industry associations to do that. Um, Stephen and I, for example, both get involved with the, uh, the China FDA through setting up the CIMDR meeting, uh, we get involved with the Asian Harmonization Working Party and here in Australia uh, support our industry associations, our biotech to, um, to deal with TGA. Um, that's important because it means that we then have a much clearer understanding of what's going on in the industry, um, understanding of the regulator's perspective and they get to know us and that builds a position of trust and credibility. So that's a little bit about the way we do business as a firm um, and, and the kind of uh, outlook we have. But enough of that, um, I'd like to move on to the webinar. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping, you should be looking at a screen, something like this. Um, this webinar is live, Stephen's just about to uh, be ready to start. Um, uh, you should see a little control panel with a little orange arrow on it. If you click the orange arrow, the control panel will expand. And if you have a question as we go through, um, type it into this little box here where it says enter a question for staff. Uh, we'll receive all of those questions and then uh, at the end of the webinar we'll go through as many of them as we can um, so that uh, we can do a live Q&A with Stephen at the end. We, if we don't get through them all we will uh, still have all the questions and everybody will receive at the end uh, an email um, with a link to the slides and a recording of the webinar and also we'll compile a, a written response to all the Q&A so that all the questions do get answered. Um, so without that, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, our um, Director of China Operations, Stephen Wen, who's going to talk about a China update, what's new with the CFDA and we're really talking about what's happened over the last year. We did one of these updates uh, in March last year, this is an update since what's happened since then. So um, Stephen, I'm now going to um, hand over control to you and um, uh, let you uh, present your webinar. Yeah, thanks, Arthur, for your introdu introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Stephen from Brandwood Biomedical China office. I'm very pleased to, to share with you some latest updates uh, from China regulatory agencies since the, this March. So today, so I'm going to talk about six topics as below. So first is about the revision to the Decree 650 and the Order 25, which is the GCP implementation. And the second wave of clinical exemption list uh, and the prioritized device evaluation pathway and the updates of the innovative evaluation pathway. And lastly, it's uh, about China new rollhards requirements. So first, let's take a look at the revision to Decree 650. As you all have known, 
Decree 650 is a framework regulation which covers all aspects of micro device administration, such as uh, registration, clinical evaluation, post-market surveillance, etc. So on May 4, 2016, CFDA had published a draft of revised articles to Decree 650 and asked for comments. All these revised articles about regulating the large medical equipment purchasing. The purpose is to assure the large medical equipment are distributed evenly across the country and are fully utilized in order to avoid any waste investment or negative competition among the hospitals. So what's a large medical equipment? It refers to those big size equipment with, uh, with the complicated technology, very expensive price, high cost of operating, or the big impact to medical expense. So those large medical equipment will be put into a particular administration catalog in the near future. Those medical institutes want to purchase a large equipment. They first need to get a permission from their local provincial administration of public health. If they fail to do so, they will receive penalty from their local government. However, how soon can CFDA publish the catalog of such a, a large medical equipment? And what's the time frame and the cost to get such purchasing permission are not clear at this stage. So this is about the proposed revision to the Decree 650. Second, Let's talk about the new Order 25, which is the GCP requirements. The GCP requirements had already become effective on June 1st this year. GCP replaced the old Order 5 about uh, clinical study for medical device in China. GCP means uh, good clinical practice. It covers not only the clinical study process, but also the responsibility of the sponsor, the medical institute, and the ethic committee. In general, I would say China GCP is quite in line with the global practice. So what are the main changes brought by GCP against the old Order 5? So hereby we provide you both the, the full text for you to read later and the key points summary for your easy to read by now. So first of all, so in past, the clinical study need to start within half year after the local type testing is done. Now you can start within one year after the testing is done. And second, for those brand new devices, the GCP ask for a pilot study with a comparatively smaller sample size before the statistically valid pivotal study. So in past, the order five only asked for animal study for the new implantable device. No pilot study required. And you can see under the new regulation, any clinical study protocol need to be filed to local province, provincial level CFDA and uh, to a certain types of high risk class 3 devices. The protocol need to be approved by CFDA beforehand. In past, it only requests the protocol of the class 3 implantable device to be filed to CMD, the, the evaluation center of the CFDA. However, the procedure to do this was never made clear. The new GCP requirements uh, that the, the sample device for clinical study must be produced under a relevant quality management system. This is a new requirement. In past, the Order 5 didn't mention anything about the quality management system.
and the new GCP specified the concept and the requirements of the multi-center clinical study. The multi-center study refers to the clinical study to be carried out by three or above institutes. All the site, all the institutes will conduct study upon the same protocol at the same time. And there must be a one coordinating investigator who is uh, responsible for implementation along with the sponsor. The study sample size and the distribution ratio between the sites must be justified by the sponsor and with a statistical rationale. And lastly, the data management and uh, uh, analyze need to be done centrally by the leading institute. This is about uh, the requirements of a multi-center study in China. And the GCP specified the responsibilities of the ISIC committee. This is new. And lastly, GCP requests the clinical institute to keep the study documents for at least 10 years. And the sponsor shall keep the documents until the device is not used in market anymore. This is uh, longer than before. So next topic is about the second wave of the clinical exemption list. As we introduced on our last webinar, if your device has already been put into the exemption list, then you don't need to do the clinical study in China or writing a clinical evaluation report according to the CFDA's guidance. You just need to make a comparison to the device description in the exemption list and make another comparison to a substantially equivalent device which had already been used in China. Then you can do the submission. The wave one exemption list which was uh, published on October 1st, 2014 included 488 class two device and the 79 class three devices. Now, CFDA had posted the draft of the Wave 2 exemption list on May 20, 2016, which include 259 Class 2 and 93 Class 3 devices. We anticipate the Wave 2 exemption list will be officially released in the next few months or so. So we are keep our, our eyes uh, on this progress. Next topic is very interesting. CFDA is proposing a prioritized evaluation pathway for medical device. The draft proposal was released on June 21st, 2016. So how to get your device prioritized? You need to meet any of the three conditions below. So first condition, from the R&D priority area, your device is set as the important scientific R&D project at state level. Second condition is from clinical priority area. If your device is to treat or diagnose some rare or urgent disease and there is no alternative or replacement therapy, uh, such as cancer uh, for pediatri pediatrics or the some uh, Asian people, yeah, those very rare disease. The last one is still to be defined by CFD yet. So how to request for a prioritized evaluation pathway? You can file your request with your final registration submission dossier to CFDA. So in case of the condition one, so CFDA will make judgment within five working days. 
in case of uh, condition two, CFDA will make monthly review to judge to which one are qualified to get into the prioritized pathway. It's interesting to make a comparison against the, uh, the innovative pathway and the prioritized pathway. There are some uh, differences. In terms of the condition, the innovative pathway requests uh, the patent registration in China, and it's it more focusing on the innovative technology with the clinical advantage. And the prioritized pathway uh, requests the state-level R&D project, the clinical urgency, no equivalent device, and the clinical advantage. So in terms of the request procedure, you need to understand that uh, in innovative pathway, you have to raise your request before the registration submission. And in prioritized pathway, you can raise the request along with the registration submission. In terms of the CFD decision time frame, the innovative pathway will need more than 40 working days for CFDA to make the decision. In prioritized pathway, as we just uh, mentioned, for condition one, they will need five working days to make the decision, and in condition two, they will do the monthly review. One advantage of the innovative pathway is that the, uh, it will provide a CFD pre-consultation before the submission, which is not uh, uh, available for the prioritized pathway. And both pathways uh, will be pi uh, prioritized for the technical evaluation. So this is a general comparison between the innovative pathway and the prioritized pathway. So next, let's look at the current status of the innovative pathway. So as we introduced on our last webinar, so innovative pathway has a significant advantage against the common review pathway. Just like we uh, mentioned, the CFDA will assign a single contact person to manage the review, and you can have the pre-consultation before the submission, which is not possible for common pathway. Since the innovative pathway had been implemented in March 2014, so up to date there were totally 67 devices had been qualified to get into the innovative pathway. So among those, 63 are local devices, and four are import devices. A few of them had already been approved. So for example, uh, I know it's a, there's a drug eluting balloon from one local company had already been approved. So among the four import devices getting to the innovative pathway, so, uh, two examples are so one is from Abbott, the, 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 the biological absorbent uh, stent. Another one is Metronics uh, litmus pacemakers. In past, so people believe that the innovat innovative pathways are only favorable to, to the local manufacturers. But now we, we have seen that uh, in some cases that uh, the multinationals can also get the innovative pathway. Our last topic for today is the China Rohars 2, which is also very, very critical to the manufacturers. This requirement is released by a number of the government departments jointly, including the China Ministry of Information and Industry or MRI, and the National Development and Reform Commission, NDRC, 
and a number of uh, other important government agencies. The Rohars 2 requirements replaced the old China Rohars 1 requirement, which was uh, released in 2006. So there are a few critical definitions. The definition of raw hearts and the hazardous substance are same as before. So for example, raw hearts means a restriction of hazardous substance in electrical and electronic products. But the definition of the electrical and electronic products has changed a little bit. It's said to the equipment with the voltage uh, under 1,500 watts DC or 1,000 watts AC. So this is a def uh, the definitions about the China Rohart's requirements. The content limits of the hazardous substance is still same as before. The difference is that uh, China will publish a product list for mandatory compliance shortly. It means so any products get into the list must make sure the hazardous substance be lower than the limit set above. The China Rohars labeling requirements is unique around the world. You can say there are two logos. One is a green, one is orange. The green logo is used on products without hazardous substance or the, the contents of the hazardous substance are below the limit. Otherwise, you have to put on the orange logo. The number in the middle of the orange logo represents the years that the products could be safely used. If the orange logo is used, you also need to put a table in the user menu to indicate the name of the hazardous substance content in each part of the device. The, you can see in the table that uh, the, the, the letter O means this uh, hazardous substance doesn't exist in this part. The letter X means uh, this substance exists in this part. You can refer to some China local standards to check the details of the Rohars content limit, labeling requirements, or test method. So for example, for the content limit, you can refer to the China local standard GBT 26572-2011, which is the requirements of the concentration limits for the certain restricted substance in electrical and electronic products. And for the labeling requirements, you can check the standard SJ slash T11364 2014, so which is a requirements about the, the logos and the tables. So what's the changes against the, the old China Rohars requirements? So first, you can see that uh, the scope of the requirements had been expanded from the electronic information products to electrical and electronic products. So the, the, the scope is much, much broader. And, and a, a mandatory compliance list will be published. Any products in this mandatory compliance list must have the hazardous substance below the limit. Under the old requirements, there was a key inspection list, but now it's removed. So this is the comparison to the old China Rohart's requirements. 
So what's the difference to the EU rollhouse requirements? So first, China has a mandatory compliance list where EU requirements doesn't have a, such a mandatory compliance list. And China rollhouse requirements doesn't have an exemption provision as the EU requirements. So in terms of the compliance evidence, China will request not only the design and the manufacturing documents, but also the labeling information, as we just introduced earlier, the logo plus the content table in user manual. So what's the actions for the suppliers of the electrical and the electronic products, including the medical device? So first, the suppliers of the electrical and the electronic products need to collect the hazardous substance content information from their upstream suppliers of all parts. For any products produced after July 1, 2016, you must put the green or orange Rohart logo and include a hazardous substance content table in the user menu for orange logo. Otherwise, you, uh, you, you, you might have trouble while uh, importing the products because the, the China custom and the AQSIQ, so they will start to inspect the compliance of the Rohart logo and the information. And lastly, so once the mandatory compliance list is published in the near future, the suppliers of the enlisted products need to take measures to make sure the hazardous substance content in those products are down to the limit. And they can only use the green logo on those products. OK, that's all for today. So thanks for any questions. Thank you, Stephen. That's a fascinating introduction, and, and uh, it never ceases to amaze me how much change happens in China. Almost every week there's a new change coming out of CFDA or one of the government agencies. Uh, a bunch of questions um, uh, have, have emerged. Um, I, I'd just like to um, take the chairman's prerogative and ask the first one. Um, I'll. Uh, Firstly, while we do the, uh, the presentation, I'm just going to um, change the screen. Here we go. Just a moment. Um, yeah. Um, so I'd like to um, uh, ask Stephen first. Uh, just generally, what's the what are the two or three biggest impacts with all these GCP changes? There's a lot of detail there, but if you're a new, if you're a manufacturer trying to enter China and bring a clinical trial, what are the biggest impacts, Stephen? What's the, maybe the two or three things that you really need to be aware of? Uh, good question, Arthur. So first of all, so I believe that uh, GCP will definitely increase the quality standard of uh, conducting clinical study in China because it uh, formalized uh, the process and sets more specific responsibilities of the older uh, involved stakeholders, like the sponsor, ethic committee, and the medical institutes. And second, so uh, during the review cycle, so CFD may come back to check the, uh, the, the compliance of the GCP, uh, including the completion and the accuracy or the authenticity of the, of the documents, including the, the original records, the firms, or the study protocols or ethic committee's approvals, etc. So both the medical institute and the sponsor mm -hmm. must be very cautious to make sure their operation during the clinical study are in compliance with the GCP. Okay. And lastly, yep. yeah. Oh, so, sorry, pardon? Carry on. Yeah, so uh, I mean, so as a result, so we also anticipate the cost and the time uh, the, uh, the sponsor spent in the clinical study in China will significantly, you know, uh, increase. 
Indeed, indeed. I'm sure it will. Um, a bunch of questions from from uh, from our audience. So, firstly, um, Tony asks a question: How do you get your device into the clinical exemption list? Very good question. Yeah, I think the best you can do is to keep your eyes on the progress and talk to your reviewers as much as possible. Uh, because the, the the mechanism to 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 make the exemption list is like this, so it's primarily you know drafted by the reviewers collectively. So many reviewers have the right to nominate some products. So uh, so for example, the, the 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 division one in the CMDE are responsible for the active device. The Division two are responsible for the non-active implantable device, right? So every reviewer has the right to nominate some products if she or he believes this product doesn't need uh, clinical study. It, re it reinforces so, what we were saying earlier about the need to be engaged with the regulator and talking to them so that if, you, if you're working with them, then, then you stand a better chance of being considered for entry onto the list. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. So more importantly, it's more importantly. So once the, the 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 initial draft of the next wave list is ready, so the CMDE will hold some roundtable meetings by inviting the industry representatives to discuss the draft. That's a good opportunity for you to raise your requests. So try to join those meetings as much as possible and explain the necessity to adding your device into the list. This is the best approach I would recommend. And, and I'm sure that those are announced on the CFDA website and you'd know when they were and if, if people wanted to find out about that, they could ask you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, Joanne asks a question and uh, this, uh, the, these prior, the, the prioritized device pathways, wanted to come to that. Joanne asks, you said one of the conditions, the first condition is to, to be considered as an important R&D project at the state level. Can you explain that? How do you get what does that mean, and how do you become an important state-level R&D uh, priority? Mm -hmm. yeah. Good question. Yeah. So at this state, so people believe so uh, this condition is more favorable to the local players. So the mechanism is like this. So every year, so the China Ministry of Science and the Technology will review and set up some state-level R&D projects about micro device. So most of the projects will be taken by university or institute, but some of them are taken by companies. So in addition to the prioritized evaluation pathway proposed by CFDA, the owner of the, each project will also receive finance sponsorship from the central government. So for example, in 2016, the Ministry of the Science and Technology has set up 69 state-level R&D projects for medical device. There were totally 16 local companies participate in 19 projects. They have already received sponsorship ranges from like 10 million RMB uh, to even 200 million RMB from the central government. And, uh, they will enjoy the prioritized uh, okay. evaluation path in the near future. So, believe, yeah. so to do this, you really have to be engaged with research activities in China, and I would suspect you have to partner with a local university or something like that, um, and and right, and, right. and then enter the and they enter the R and D funding pathway, and then that gives you uh, some priority in the regulatory outcomes as well. Okay, thank you. That, that's right, that's, right. that's that's clear. Thank you. Um, uh, let me see what other questions we've got here. Um, uh, Danica asks a couple of questions actually. Uh, Danica asks about ROS labeling. So, is the labeling for ROS expected to be on the device itself or just on the packaging? Uh, good question. So, ideally, the logo need to be on the device itself where possible. However, uh, to some device uh, with the small smaller size or uh, for the implantable device, for example, for the pacemakers stand, it's not realistic to put the, the logo on the on the device itself, right? Mm -hmm. So you can put on the on, on the on the box as well. Right. So for the 
external equipment, external big equipment, you need to put the logo on the device. Okay, understood, understood. And um, does uh, Stuart asks about again about Roche? So, um, does Roche two apply to spare parts or just the finished device? Uh, good question. So, my understanding of the requirements is that if that's a the system, uh, you need to put the the uh, the logo on both the 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 main machine or uh, and the, the those individually packaged parts because okay. it, it's possible it's possible so uh, that in case of the system that uh, different parts or diff different unit the uh, the machine may have different row hearts ta table uh, row hearts logo for example the main machine is with a green logo is possible but some parts. Some individually packaged parts may may have to use the the, 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 the orange logo because it, it does has the, the or, hazardous. Uh, or, or the other way around, you may have some parts which are free of the hazardous components, and uh, but the the whole machine requires the orange logo. Okay, understood. So so it does apply to the separately supplied spare parts. Um, let me just see if we got any other. Um... Okay, um, coming to to the. Uh, um, import the innovative device pathway. Nancy asks a question. Says, have any of the four imported devices, Nick, have any of them been approved yet? Uh, I believe not. Okay. Uh, it's because the innovative pathway you start by by very early stage, right? So before the submission. So as far as I know, so no, and not approved. Just uh, get into the you know, pa uh, innovative pathway list, but not even submitted yet. Right. I, I, I think there are some submissions that have been made, but um, I, I don't know. So we, we've not seen any actual approvals for importers at this stage. Right. Okay. Well, one point, uh, the, one critical point uh, about innovative pathway is that so any products in the innovative pathway uh, need to do the clinical study in China. So you, you need to understand this, that uh, uh, once you request an innovative pathway, it means that you are ready to do the clinical study in China. Okay. That takes time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, Abby, um, welcome, Abby. Um, Abby asks a question. Abby, I know, is in Toronto, and I know Abby's in Toronto because Abby used to be one of her employees here in, in Brandwood Biomedical and is, uh, is now based in Toronto. Um, welcome to the webinar. And Abby asks the question, um, where can the list of state-level projects be accessed? Is it available online? Is, is, that, is that information available, um, uh, uh, the state-level and R&D um, projects? Uh, yes, the information are, are open. Uh, if uh, if necessary, so uh, we can provide a list. Okay, well, we, in, in in the email that we'll send around, maybe we can find a provide a link and, and send that on. Um, okay, thank you. Um, Jeremy asks. Um, Coming back to clinical trials again now, uh, under the Order 25 for multi-center trials, it mentions that sites must um, start at the same time. Um, how precise is that, Stephen? How much flexibility? Because clearly not everybody's going to start on precisely the same day. I, I understand that the intent is that they should be broadly contemporary, but not exactly the same. Is that right? Uh, right, I think so. It, it doesn't mean that you must uh, start at the same day, but uh, in general, it's, uh, it, it needs to uh, go in, in parallel according it's, to your protocol. Thank you, thank you. So it's a, it's a broad requirement that all sites are working right. at roughly the same time. Okay. Um, now, again on um, uh, clinical studies, Danica asks another question. If the device does not have a clinical study in the country of origin where it was manufactured, what information do you require for registration? Uh, it depends. So, uh, uh, as we uh, introduced, there are three pathway, three pathway to submit clinical evidence, mm -hmm. right? So it's possible. It's possible that your device uh, had never done any clinical study in your own country. It's possible, right? Mm -hmm. But in case that your device had already been put into the uh, exemption list in China. So for example, there are many simple class two device has already been put into the exemption list. 
Mm-hmm. And you don't uh, you don't have the clinical study report in your own country. It doesn't matter. So you can, as far as it's in the exemption list, you can just follow the the requirements to make a comparison to to the to the comparison list and the substantially equivalent device in China. Yes. Yeah. And second uh, pathway is uh, even your device is not in the exemption list, but you can uh, make a comparison to uh, to the another substantially equivalent device which had already been used in China, you can write a CER, a clinical evaluation report. It's, n- it's not a mandatory requirement that you must do any clinical study in your own country. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, the, um, let me just see, what other questions have we got? Ah, yes, uh, another question. Uh, Ross came into effect on the 1st of July. Um, does, do companies need to do anything now, or do they, do they wait until this mandatory list is published? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, the, the, they need to take actions by now, so uh, they need to put the, the correct logo and, uh, and the, the table in the menu. So whatever the, 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 the green logo or, or the, the orange logo. The, the mandatory compliance list means that for any products get into the list, you must take measures to reduce the, 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 the hazardous substance down to the limit. So for example, if you have one product, now you can use the orange logo. But once it's be put into the compliance list, you must make some, uh, take some actions to change some parts or something to, to assure the content limits are reduced down to the, level, down to the limit. So second step. Second step. You, you, you understand? Yes, I do. I do. Okay. So, um, thank you. I think that answers that question. Um, the uh, let me just see a couple more questions here. Um, yes. Uh, coming back to the innovative pathway, but thinking specifically about clinical trials. If you go down the innovative device pathway, Nancy asks um, a question. I think I know the answer to this one. Um, If you go down the innovative device pathway, does that mean you've got to do a local clinical trial? And my understanding is yes. Is that correct? That if you if you go if you're applying for an innovative device priority, then that pathway requires a clinical trial. Is that correct? Uh, Yes, that's correct. So uh, on a training course uh, held by CFD, uh, CFD clearly. Stressed that for uh, for the innovative pathway, you have to do the clinical study in China. But it's it, interesting that uh, during the pre-consultation uh, for the in, innovative products, you might have the opportunity to to negotiate the how to do the how to do the clinical study in China. Because I heard uh, that it's it might be feasible that you you. You, uh, you 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 do the multi center a uh, uh, global multi center study including China okay. for those uh, innovative pathway yeah which is not uh, I think which is not possible for for common pathway okay interesting so so there may be some flexibility and that's helpful because you've got this opportunity for pre consultation um, yeah, yeah. good okay um, let me just see. Uh, And uh, again, on the clinical uh, pathway, Stephanie asks a question. Can you discuss a little bit if what the reality is? Is CFDA really accepting the uh, the the use of equivalence or clinical evaluation reports, or are they forcing people into the clinical trial despite that pathway existing? So, what's the reality? How is it really possible to to use a clinical evaluation report, and is CFDA uh, accepting that approach? I would say yes, because uh, uh, there are some companies they have already been uh, passed uh, at the evaluation by submitting the CER. Right. But mostly, so the, uh, those companies are uh, like GE Healthcare or some. Uh, they have quite good, uh, you know, the, the predicate device yes. uh, information in China. So that's the basis. They have uh, they have device proved and used in China for a long, t- long time. They have good traceability mm-hmm. about uh, all the uh, device information to make the comparison. 
Okay. Can, can I ask a follow-up question on, on that specific thing? So how good does the information have to be about the predicate device? I've, um, can you use a competitor's device or really does this only work when you own the predicate? Is it one of your own devices? How, do, how does that work? How, how much do you need to know about the predicate? So far, so CFD strongly prefer your own predicate device because uh, their point of view is that if you use the competitor's device, so how you make sure that the information are sufficient and accurate? Because they, 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 they ask you to, to make a very, very detailed comparison, mm -hmm. so like the uh, production process or something. So how, how can you get the, the, those information from a competitor? So if the, you, you use the competitor information, they will ask you to, to submit a formal like agreement with the, the competitor that you, you are used to those information legally, but that's it's uh, very difficult. You, you can imagine that, right? Thank you. Okay. I, uh, yes. Yes. So, so really, it's uh, it's easier if you're using your own device as a predicate. Um, if it's somebody else's, then you you've got a bit of a job to do to to justify that you've got enough information and and, and complete information. Okay. Um, Quick one on GCP guidelines. Uh, Manish asks, are the GCP guidelines available in English? Um, I don't believe they are, but um, and I know we've we've attempted a simple translation here, um, but we've not published anything. Um, uh, are the guidelines available in English at, at the moment, or do you have to get them and, and do a Google Translate yourself? Uh, for GCP, uh, GCP, yes, we, we do have a, a few versions of about of the English translation. It's done by the by some some companies or the China Medical Association or something. But uh, to be honest, I, as I read, uh, the, the quality is, uh, the trans translation quality is not perfect. But anyway, that's good for, uh, good for reference. We can share with you that. Okay, so we'll perhaps send around a link for a, for a, for an English right. language version. Um, um, coming back to Roche, uh, another question here. Um, uh, Danica asks, is, is, is this requirement for ROSE, is it a CFDA registration requirement or is it primarily an import requirement? So who's going to police ROSE? Uh, no, no, this is not from CFDA, it's from the, uh, as we uh, shown on the, on the slide, it's uh, from a number of the other agencies yeah. jointly. But that's very, very important because the, those agencies, those government agencies, including the China, means Ministry of the Custom and the AQSIQ. Right. AQSIQ is the administration of the... The quarantine uh, service. Department. So, yeah, they're going to check. They're going to check the, the, the Rohar's compliance during the importation inspection. So this is very, very serious. Okay, so, so this is uh, something you have to get right because it will be checked as it enters the country. Okay. Um, so, a uh, question from Ray, um, and make sure I understand this, do product renewals submitted now um, need to have the same, this is a more general um, question, uh, need the product renewals, renewals which are submitted now need to have exactly the same models and things like pack sizes registered as, as was in the original or can um, can this be generic? Um, I think the question, uh, and it applies for class two and three devices. So if you've got an existing registration, which perhaps declares particular sizes or so on, um, do you have to have exactly the same or can you make it more general when you renew? Um, no, so act, uh, theoretically, you cannot make any changes to the products, including the even the description or the model numbers or something. Uh, so the products and the submission scope must be exactly the same as the initial approval. The only, yeah, the only exception is you can delete some models or remove some parts, but you cannot, you cannot change anything or add anything. The only thing you can do is uh, you, you, you can say some of the models are obsolete, so I, I can remove that from license. That's the only thing okay. you can do. Okay. Yeah. For any other changes, you need to go for the, uh, the product change pathway. 
Okay, and, you know, and what would be, Stephen, what would be your recommendation? So say a manufacturer intends to introduce maybe a new size, a new pack size, or a new variant, um, and they're coming up for renewal, uh, should they do the variation first and then do the renewal, or should they introduce the changes in the renewal? What's the best way to do this? Uh, so first of all, so you, you cannot combine uh, those uh, technical change along with the uh, renewal submission. You have to separately. But you can do in parallel or one before another. So it's up to you. So the, the principle is, so, so which one is uh, uh, approved first? So which one can be you know, implemented? So it means that uh, if the renewal is approved first, mm -hmm. you can continue to sell the exactly the same products as before. You cannot sell the variant. You cannot sell the, the new products, right? Okay. So once the technical change application is approved, you can start to to oh, I see. To so that's a separate application which runs separate. alongside and it doesn't and it can be before or after. Okay, that's that's clear. Yeah. Thank you. Um and uh here's one an interesting one from Ram. He's asking um can the device uh can you seek a uh um an exemption from clinical trials I'm assuming uh if there are two distinct devices in China which together um, cover the intended use. So this is a bit analogous to the US FDA's idea of uh, multiple predicates. And I know that United States FDA over the last couple of years has really clamped down and, and doesn't like multiple predicates anymore. So uh, what about in China? If you've got two devices in the marketplace which sort of together cover the intended use of yours, um, is that possible? Yes, yes, yes. So you can compare to uh, to, to, to multiple predicate devices. Right. Uh, so that is possible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Possible. Um, and and CFDA accept that and, and are comfortable with that. Uh, yes, yes. I think it's uh, it, it's covered by the guidance. It, it does mention that uh, you can compare to predicate device, uh, but multiple predicate device to 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 for the full indication, right? For the full intended right. use. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. A couple more questions. Um, we've, we've talked about standards um, here a few times. Um, where do you look for standards, Stephen? Uh, they're available online or where do you get these China standards? Uh, yes, so if you, you know exactly the, the name uh, and the number of the standards, so you can search on uh, website. Um, uh, there are some Chinese uh, websites they can offer the, even okay. the free download of the standard. Uh, okay. there, there's some library you can do that. Okay. And we can also help them. We we can provide a link to that in the in the email response. Um, a question on the mandatory list that we're waiting on the uh, the mandatory roast list. Um, do you have any idea of um, what medical devices are likely to appear on this mandatory list? Uh, sorry, no. So we have no idea. No on, idea. On that. There's not been any consultation or anything on that at all. Okay. Um, finally, maybe maybe I'll just ask one last question. I'd, I wouldn't mind if you went over again the three pathways because we went through them fairly briefly in the webinar. So um, there's the pathway if you're in the exemption list, the pathway if you're not in the list but you've got access to a predicate, and the third pathway is if you're not in the list and there's no access to a predicate or there is no predicate. Can you just outline again what you must do in each okay. of those three cases? Okay. Yeah, sure, of course. So. Yeah. The first pathway, the exemption list, right? So uh, once your product had already been put into the exemption list, you need to do two comparison table. So first comparison table is against the, the definition in the exemption list. So for example, the X-ray machine, the X-ray machine definition, what's X-ray machine? You just need to make a comparison to, to, to justify. So my device is the X-ray machine, okay. right? So the second uh, is another comparison table is uh, uh, compared to a predicate device. But here it's very, very critical uh, to remember that uh, in case of exemption list, you can com compare to the competitor's predicate device. Here the comparison is uh, uh, comparatively uh, simple. For example, you can compare to the, to the, uh, the your, your uh, competitor's X-ray machine. Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, but the condition is that that machine, uh, the X-ray machine, must be approved and used in China. 
Is that clear? Yes, it is. Thank you. So, yeah, this is uh, the pass one. So the pass two is that your product is not in the exemption list, but you have your own predicate device in China. So for example, uh, the, the, the pacemaker. The pacemaker is, is a high-risk device. It's not in the exemption list. But I have uh, my predicate pacemaker approved and used in China. Then I need to write a CER. So the first part of the CER would be a detailed comparison against the predicate pacemaker. Much, much more information than the simple comparison table for the uh, exemption list. Then you need to do the literature search. You need to summarize the, 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 uh, the, the post-market surveillance data or something to compose the CER or submission. So this is a pass two. So the pass three is that uh, your product is not in the exemption list and you don't have any predicate device approved in China. So for example, for the, for the, the, the drug, eluting stent, it's a, a brand new technology. You don't have any predicate device. This is a, your first generation of such product in China. Then you have to do the clinical study in China. Okay. So that's the three pathway. Thank you. That, that's very clear. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think uh, we'll wind up at that point. Thank you, Stephen. That's been a fascinating discussion um, and uh, an awful lot going on, as I think everybody will agree. Um, we will uh, dis distribute by email to everybody who's registered a link to the slides, a link to the recording of this webinar, and we'll do a, a, an email summary mail out to everybody on, on the Q&A just to make sure we've captured all those questions. Um, I look forward to um, meeting some of you. Uh, just wanted to point out that we will be at, uh, Brandwood Biomedical will be at a couple of large meetings in the near future, so I'm looking forward to going to Chengdu in a few weeks' time in September. Um, uh, we're, um, we're running a biocompatibility forum. That's a particularly uh, interesting event. That's one of the world's largest regulatory events these days. Uh, um, well over a thousand people attend um, the China International Medical Devices Regulatory Forum um, and that uh, that uh, uh, also includes a bunch of subfora um, in where we uh, run one on biocompatibility. Um, we've taken uh, some of the lead experts from the ISO committee that write the 10993 standards to China uh, for the last two CIMDRs. This is the third time we're doing it. Um, so uh, that's really the only place in the world where all of those experts together and do a workshop on biocompatibility. So that's an interesting thing. And then uh, in the following week in, uh, in San Jose, California, in Silicon Silicon Valley will be at the RAPS meeting, um, America's largest um, regulatory affairs gathering, um, where a couple of us are presenting. My colleague Grant Bennett's going to be giving a presentation on labeling requirements in this part of the world in the Asia Pacific, and I get to participate in um, in the uh, uh, conversations that matter session with a panel talking about the interrelation with policy and regulation. We'll be out there with a booth. Stop by at booth 105. Look forward to seeing you there. Um, thank you again, Stephen. Uh, a really good webinar, and thank you so much to our audience for listening. Um, we've had quite a large number of attendees this time round, um, and good day to you all.